Irene, welcome to My Healthy Mind. Thank you. We're so glad to have you here today. Thank you. You've lived an extraordinary life filled with extreme challenges, unimaginable suffering and loss, and yet here you are, a joyful, healthy, strong person living a rich, productive life. How did that happen? You know, I have been asked that question many times. How come that you are not angry? You seem to have so much love to give. Explain. You know, I really have no clear answer. I believe that we each come into this world as a different package. And I was fortunate to come as a package with a lot of energy and optimism, always looking at the half full and not the half empty. So let's go back to Warsaw, Poland, when you were five years old. Yes. And tell us about what your life was like before the war. My parents were both working people. That is, my father was a skilled furniture maker. I still remember how they were putting together the veneer pieces to make, to cover amours. Uh, we lived in modest surroundings, but I was not missing any essentials of living. I would say it was a comfortable, happy childhood in the winter of 39 or 40. Our parents decided that they want to escape Poland and go to the Soviet Union. My father was a leader also in the labor union and I'm sure they felt that they would be among the first ones to be persecuted by the Nazis. So they tried to escape to the Soviet Union, sold the lease to our apartment, hired a guy to smuggle us across. But we ended up on the no man's land in the winter for about six weeks, six to seven weeks in the winter in an open field. So no man's land was sort of a neutral territory yeah, that wasn't? No, yes, it's between the two countries. It can be between others and it doesn't belong to either, yes. So describe your life there. Well, we came there. Uh, this guide was supposed to take us across the Soviet Union but he dumped us off in the no man's land without my parents being aware that it was the place. And we huddled up for the remainder of the night, not knowing what's beyond the area where they left. When we came out from that secluded area where we spent the rest of the night, we saw a field with thousands of people laying on the snow, leaning against bags, suitcases. I was on the no man's land, I think somewhere six or seven weeks, extremely cold. Uh, my mother would repeat over and over, move, move. If you move, you are not going to be that cold. In spite of my moving, my foot, foot, feet got frostbitten. I had open wounds, was unable to wear my shoes. My mother tore a garment of hers, wrapped my feet in rags, and I was shuffling around. I remember many scenes from the no man's, starting with the no man's land, but two of them particularly are so vivid in my mind as I, I have it right in front of me. I woke up one night, and there was a strange man next to me under the covers. I tried to push him out, but apparently I fell asleep. In the morning when I woke up, the man next to me was dead. People were dying from diseases, from exposure, from starvation. And the young man buried them in shallow graves. Another scene I remember. I was standing with my mother by a fire trying to warm myself. There were lots of wood in the areas and people make, made fires to warm themselves and also to melt the snow for drinking because there was no other source of water. And a young woman approached holding a baby in her arms wrapped in blankets. People assumed that she wanted to warm herself and her infant. So they parted, letting her come close to the fire. But as she did so, a man looked into her arms and said, Lady, your baby doesn't need warming anymore. The baby was dead. 
My parents apparently concluded that they have to take some drastic steps, but we are not going to survive. There seemed to be no end to it. So my father smuggled himself across the border one night. There he bribed an official to give him a letter saying that he may cross the border. But when he returned, the letter said only he may take his children. So my father took my sister and myself to safety to the Soviet Union. We walked the whole night in the forest. And my feet were frostbitten by then. I wasn't able to wear shoes. I had open wounds that were wrapped in rags. And the earth was frozen and hard. So it was an excruciating pain. But we made it to the city where my parents were headed, called Bialystok. There were clusters of Jews around that city. We ended up in one such cluster. And so when did you see your mother again? Uh, strangely out of nowhere. A few months, a few weeks. I don't know exactly how it is. My mother showed up. The door of the cabin opened. And our mother woke. You can imagine my joy, my excitement, and also confusion. Uh, I didn't know whether she was alive. We didn't know. We didn't hear anything from her. And she showed up. That so was a marvelous experience. But it didn't last. It didn't last. Soviet, we heard that Soviet soldiers were coming in the middle of the night, taking away all the young men. And no one knew what, what happened to these men. And one day there was a rumor that our cluster were scheduled for such a raid. So my mother took the train to the city where my dad worked to warn him not to come back until he hears from her. But she missed the train coming back to us. And that night when my sister and I were alone, Soviet soldiers kicked in the door of the cabin. They said, get your stuff. And they marched us to a train station where there was a long line of kettle cars. And it was such a frightening feeling to see that we are alone without our parents and those soldiers were shoving in, shoving in people and those. But fortunately and miraculously somehow, when the platform was almost empty of people, we saw our parents from a distance. Mm. So let's remember you were five years old. And yes. your sister, she was eight? Eight. Okay. Eight and a half, about five and a half years. And you think you're about to be taken on a train with just you and your sister, and then your parents miraculously showed up. An amazing, mm -hmm. amazing, wonderful feeling. So you were happy for a moment, but then the train takes off. The train was so packed. It's a cargo train. So packed that people were just sitting in upright position. There was no room to lie down. They were leaning against whatever they could. Uh, and you know, they would pull the doors together, slide them, and a heavy metal bar. And the inside was so dark, there were no windows. The only light we had was that which was coming bet between the cracks of the boards. After about six or eight weeks on it, we ended up in a labor camp in the Siberian taiga. With our little houses, the taiga is a very dense forest kind of covering northern part of Russia. Our little houses were placed right against the forest. We had bears coming to the door front. Uh, at night we heard Siberian wolves howling and we were so scared. I don't know if it's true or not, but we heard all kinds of stories of wolves attacking people, particularly in the dark. And you know, in Siberia, in winter time, the daylight is only about three hours. And then it's dark like night. And temperature would drop the, to 50, five below. We did not have clothing for that kind of a climate. If a bird didn't fly away on time, it would freeze to the tree like a lump of ice. How did you survive? I don't know. A day at a time. A day at a time. We lived for stretches of time on boiled grass and leaves. 
my mother would go into the field, pick up leaves, grass, whatever was, avail was available, boil it, drink it first herself if she will survive it or if she would get sick. If she was okay, she would give it to us as well. My sister and I ended up in an orphanage while my, our parents were alive. And there, some, there were some Jews from Poland who set up orphanages there, and this was simply an attempt of saving the children from dying of starvation and would recruit any Jewish child from Poland. My sister and I ended up for a few years in that orphanage, and my father died while we were in the orphanage, yes. In 46, I came back to Poland and still spent another four or five years in orphanages after the war. And what was so important for me, I just in the orphanage just dreamt of normalcy, of living in a small house with my family, not a hundred kids in one room, not to be hungry again, to attend a normal school and to see back my cousins and aunts, uncles. My extended family in, Por in Poland was probably close to 100 members. But I, when I returned to Poland, nothing of what I envisioned became reality. All my relatives, every one of them, were killed during the Holocaust. The school that I attended was a Jewish school for Jewish kids. There were just a handful of us. They took us one through the concentration camps, where I saw lamps with shades made of human skin, soap made of human flesh, a huge pile of hair, women who had long hair, they cut their hair before sending them to death. It took an enormous length of time before I could take a bar of soap in my hand and not think of my aunt's uncles. thinking this is maybe one of my aunt's uncles and that bar of soap. My job was causing me so much stress. I felt disconnected and frightened. I felt so isolated. I was beginning to feel trapped, depressed. I never expected that to happen to me. We think nobody else feels the pain that we feel, but that is so untrue. It's good to be able to talk about it. I was able to seek help. I found it from Team Wellness. It's a sense of freedom. Team Wellness Center, you are not alone. In 1950, I joined my mother to go to Israel. That was a different chapter of my life with different challenges. I didn't know anyone in Israel. I also didn't know the spoken language Hebrew. It was a very complicated and difficult chapter, but I survived. There were many times there too that my food was a green pepper and a piece of bread, and that I had to look to get a day's work so I would be able to eat the next day. And a day's work would me to scrub someone's floor or to do anything like that. But I survived. And then you triumphed because you became a teacher. Yes, I had a lot of courage and a lot of gumption too. I heard there was an intensive, what they call teacher's college, but basically one year of training and I applied, so I didn't know enough uh, Hebrew to explain to the director what I wanted, but the whole story why he did accept me. A year later, I became a teacher in the public school system, only in Hebrew, having 49 students in the first grade and going with the 49 students 
for the second grade too. Wow, that's quite a transition. It, yes. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, when I was young, I was picking up languages very, very fast, yes. So you got married and you came to Detroit, and then what? Did your life improve from there? When I came to live permanently, I, I was married, had a baby, and my language was extremely limited, but I was so eager to go to school. I was always interested in studying psychology. Maybe by seeing be such a diverse and such a cruel and also kind behavior of people, it always made me curious, what is the driving force underneath all that range of behaviors? And I wanted to study psychology. I went to the evening college, University of Cincinnati. I got a psychology degree though I had a baby. I had a master's then in social psychology. A few years later, I entered Xavier University, also in Cincinnati, and got a second master's, an MBA, with a major in hospital management. I was a director of, men, of uh, Livingston County Mental Health Department but also thereafter director of treatment center for drug addicted and mentally ill women. And I had always felt that I have to be the voice of the voiceless. The women who were deprived any opportunity to fight for their rights, and I'm talking about the drug addicted women or the mentally ill women or the mentally ill people at all. I was always an advocate for their rights and spoke up many times in Lansing, was invited to speak and had the opportunity there to defend them and to get, though I was not a hand-on psychologist, I was the director of whatever division I was on, but I was so close with those primary caregivers that it gave me a great opportunity to see the suffering of those who were ill and the misunderstanding in the community of what are the causes and how to help those people. So, Irene, you've told us what happened after the war, where you went, what you did, and how you came to the United States, but mentally, how did you survive emotionally? How did you keep going forward with such trauma in your past? You know, I am asked many times, how I don't project any anger. I don't have any anger. No bitterness, I don't. How did I do that? I don't have a clear-cut answer to that. It was a day at a time. Uh, always looking for something to get involved in. Always using my energy, trying to do something constructive. And you were doing that through the advocacy work you were doing in mental health? Very much so, mm -hmm. very much so. And I was known in the state that I am very vocal. And when it came to some state hearing that had to do with mental health, I uh, was always there, yes. Irene, how does someone who's endured such trauma use that to help others by working in the mental health field? Without consciously doing it, it probably took me a while to come to terms with myself that I am a Holocaust survivor. I was always denying it, uh, using all those using all excuses, like I don't have numbers on my hand. It was easier for me not to think about it, but to keep all my memories locked up in the attic somewhere. Slowly a time came, the realization 
that I, the so-called proverbial cat, what is it, of eight lives, nine lives, <laughs> put those things all together to become Irene and feel comfortable not to deny the tough times that I experience, but to accept them, to accept them. And with the acceptance came also some reminders that I carried from my childhood, that I am, can do anything I want to. My father was a labor union leader, and people would say to me kiddingly often, if you don't lose this and that, if you become a better uh, in control, I was as a child losing all kinds of things, you can make, be a great general or a leader like your father. She and always said she is a leader like a father. She can do anything that she wants to. That was one memory probably helped me to feel that I am strong and I can do things. And then what I carried from my childhood home. My parents were deeply rooted cultural Jews, not religious, but very committed to social justice and fairness. And without verbalizing it, they lived the, by the ethical Jewish principle called in Hebrew, tikkun olam. Tikkun olam literally means repairing the world. Implied in it is that we each have a responsibility to do everything we can to make this world a little better for everyone. I have led my life, my adult life, most of my time that I remember based on that principle to do everything I can to make a, the world a little better for everyone. Irene, thank you for sharing some time with us. Your history gives you a perspective that most of us cannot even imagine. So we appreciate that you're sharing your wisdom with us today. Can you tell us how some of your experiences and learned techniques can be used by our viewers to have a healthier, more joyful life? I would try. I don't think of them in terms of technique, but in terms of approach to life, preferences, putting things in perspective. I have always tried when something happens to me that I would get upset or whatever, I always paused to ask myself, put it in perspective of all the things that happen to your life and all the things that go on in the world. Is this so important? Will this change the quality of your life one way or another? Will it harm or help others in the world? And when I see that none of that is the case, then I tell myself, drop it, and get involved immediately in something constructive. If you cannot take a good book to read, oh, Cook a big pot of soup, bring some to a friend who will appreciate it. Think of someone who will need your help and forget about all those insignificant things. Get yourself involved in something constructive immediately. And if it still doesn't happen, find a friend who will be just a good listener. A friend who will be a good listener. A good listener. Mm -hmm. And they will help. Might Once you say it aloud, you sometimes put it in perspective, too. And one thing that I always do is try to surround myself by positive thinking people. I don't like to be around people who are gripers, complainers, doomsday lookers for. I want to be surrounded by positive people. And I like to be surrounded by people who are doers, not just talkers. 
And it doesn't mean what they do as long as it's something constructive, as long as something positive. My quote approach to tikkun olam that I mentioned to you, what it means repairing the world or doing good, everyone does it in the way that works for them. So being surrounded by positive people, not dwelling on things that are insignificant, not reliving past mistakes. Forgive yourself if you did a mistake. Acknowledge you did a mistake, you wouldn't do it now. Forgive yourself. And if it's a mistake that you feel you did something against another person, then apologize and accept it and go on. Go on with the future and don't dwell on the past. Thank you, Irene. And thank you for joining us today on this courageous and often terrifying journey of devastation, loss, resilience, and ultimately embracing life. If you'd like to read or talk about this or any mental health issue, please reach out to us on our website, myhealthymind.com, on Twitter at MyHealthyMind, or on Facebook. We'll see you next week for another edition of My Healthy Mind. Let's talk about it.